Lake municipal area in 1381, it would have been more rough and ready. But the most interesting thing is there would have been direct access back down. Hang on, hang on a minute. Come and have a look at this. Yeah, you got a cab? I'm afraid we got a cab. <laughs> we were expecting the clip clop of three horses about three hours ago. Oh, well done, mate. Well done. Well done. We're about another two hours after we left you. So, probably another eight, ten miles. Yeah. Then what happened? Well, Louis was. He, I mean, he's not lame, lame, but he was starting to be very gentle on that hoof, and I needed to look after the horse, so I called it a day. Stick yourself down there. But so we didn't kind of make it, but then in a way we did. Well, very much so we did. I mean, we have covered at least the same distance that they did, probably more. Yeah. It's not a big deal for a medieval traveller to have covered that sort of distance on the right sort of horses. Yeah. Mike, it's not a big deal for a medieval traveller on the right kind of horses, but hasn't this really blown out of the water, this idea that thousands of people came up from Kent and Essex, because you weren't going to have that many horses available. There wasn't going to be that much grub available, surely. I think certainly that the, the idea that um, a single group uh, descended on London from Canterbury is difficult to sustain in the light of this experiment. What fascinates me about it is that it certainly uh, demonstrates the need to use horses and the need to have backup, um, and that's absolutely critical. Which seems to me to suggest possibly one's talking about a small group of horse riders who were really going around encouraging others to rise up, coordinating events, and really acting as something of a militant spearhead um, in the move towards London. Um, the, the suggestions that's brought out from this experiment um, seems to be borne out by the judicial records of the proceedings against the rebels, which suggests a similar sort of mix. A few real militant uh, uh, leaders from Kent coming up from Canterbury, presumably horse riding in the same way that you did, with other supporters who joined them as they assembled here on Blackheath. Does that work for you? Oh, it works for me enormously. I mean, I see it as a strike force, as people whipping up the fervour. Those who had the economic ability to do that, travelling horse, but you say small groups, a hundred horsemen. Can you, you remember the sound of those amblers? Come, three of them coming up. Imagine that a hundred times, the dust, the noise, coming into a little village. That was a huge event, and it would have gathered like a snowball. And closer we got to London, more and more people. So the kind of thing that I learnt at school of thousands and thousands of ignorant peasants marching through the countryside and then ending up in London seems not to be the case. But what we can see is the idea of, of flying pickets, smart people, experienced people, people with good horses, just a few of them coming here, meeting up and whipping yeah. everything it's up. A, it's a much more varied, uh, complex uh, picture than, uh, the, than the classic uh, view would lead us to believe. Well, we've got the authentic place, we've got the authentic rebels, we've got the authentic campfire. Uh, I suggest we turn it off and uh, go down the boozer. <laughs> you going for that? Yes. <laughs> North of the Thames, the other rebel army from Essex camped outside the city walls at Mile End. These twin armies had blazed through the countryside. In the capital, people waited in trepidation as peasants from Kent and Essex threatened to change the country for good. The Peasants' Revolt was the most astonishing popular uprising of the Middle Ages. It was a response to a century that was hell to live in. On top of plague, famine and war, the government had imposed a poll tax. In 1381, the people snapped. Within two weeks, a mixture of farmers, tradesmen and landless labourers were on the brink of overthrowing the social order. The rebels had marched on London to present their demands for justice to the boy King Richard II in person. Fifteen days in, and two vast armies from Kent and Essex were camped north and south of the Thames.
We've discovered that the rebels who camped here on Black Heath under their leader Watt Tyler weren't just yokels. The so-called peasants were highly organised and politically sophisticated. They wanted change and they wanted freedom. Right here on that Thursday morning, on the day of the Catholic feast of Corpus Christi, the rebel clergyman John Ball celebrated mass and preached one of the most famous sermons ever, a political manifesto as radical as Marxism 500 years later. He asked, when Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? In other words, the very first people that God created weren't gentry, they were ordinary working folk who dug their fields and made their own clothes. The message was clear. The whole system of nobility wasn't ordained by God. In fact, it ran directly counter to God's will. So, with God on their side, the rebels set off to put that right. King Richard and his court had no idea how radical the demands of the rebels were, so they'd got no plan to deal with them. In fact, they had little plan at all. They agreed to an arm's length meeting. This is an illustration of what seems to have been an extraordinarily impractical arrangement. The King and his advisers got on barges at the Tower of London and sailed to Rotherhithe to where the peasants were massing. The idea was that they'd have a safe stretch of water between them and the mob. And according to the chronicles, the King told them to go home. Although I can't actually imagine that the King said it himself. Presumably one of the aristocrats said, what should we do, my lord? And the King said, tell them to go home. And the aristocrat went, the King says, go home. But that does seem to be a pretty pathetic tactic. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. This isn't working very well, is it? Hang on. Can you turn the engine off, mate? I said it seems a pretty pathetic tactic to just simply have said, go away. It certainly was, but there's chaos in the king's advisers at this time. His ministers do not really know how to deal with this. They're not quite sure how um, large the revolt has become, and their earlier efforts to send out messengers to try and intercept the rebels and tell them to go home simply hasn't worked. So what did the king do? Well, the king and a small flotilla of barges basically stop in the river and wait for the rebels to shout what they want. And what did they want? The rebels ask, can we meet the king in person? And does he agree? Well, we're not sure exactly what the king wants, but it seems that his ministers say to him definitely, do not get off the boat, it's not safe. So they try and keep him on the boat. So what did the peasants actually demand? Well, what they ask for now is a list of important men to be handed over for them to deal with themselves. Like who? Well, it reads like a list of the who's who of late medieval England. It's the top men in the king's government, including the chancellor, the treasurer, the lord keeper of the privy seal, and some senior judges who've been involved in prosecuting the men who are refusing to pay the poll tax. So presumably some of them would have been in this little flotilla of barges. Well, it seems more than likely that a lot of these men are actually around Richard at the time. So it puts both them and the young king in a difficult situation. So presumably he didn't hand them over? No, he doesn't probably because he's been stalling for time. And then what does he do? Well, the flotilla simply goes back to the tower. Well, presumably the peasants weren't very happy about that. The peasants are absolutely outraged by this, and they simply decide, well, if the king is not going to come to us, then we are going to come to him and force him to listen to us. And they did. They marched into Southwark and broke open the king's bench jail, freeing the prisoners. Army deserter Thomas Wooten used the opportunity to pinch six silver spoons belonging to the jailer's wife. But the revolt had popular support across all classes. The rebels were joined by respectable local citizens, like John Mocking. He'd made a fortune importing wine for wealthy Londoners. He was a leading member of the congregation at St Olaf's, where his brother was rector. 